uh, Sun Wan Choi. Welcome back to the second day of the summer school. I will continue the lectures by Anatoly Prokofikov. Okay, I welcome everyone again. I, I hope I didn't scare you too much yesterday. <clears throat> so uh, that's where we stopped last time. Uh, I remind you I was uh, discussing uh, uh, this adiabatic gauge potential and, and as a generator of adiabatic transformations in quantum and classical systems and uh, <clears throat> how we can find it. So uh, just to uh, give uh, heads up, so today I will mostly discuss how we can use this machinery to detect chaos, ergodicity, integrability, uh, how we can distinguish these regimes. Um, and I will show some, like, you know, very recent results. Actually, some just appeared today in archive, uh, uh, just to maybe bring you to, to what at least we are interested in right now. So uh, now uh, it's actually a good point to start this lecture. I will try to connect now adiabatic information and what is known as a quantum information geometry. Some people say quantum geometry, some people say information geometry. Uh, I'm not going to discuss measurement aspect of this, uh, but uh, if you uh, read about Fisher information, people discuss quantum in Fisher information, it's actually part of this story. Uh, so, and uh, I will uh, take a, a, another sort of detour and I will uh, now consider a situation where we are interested in one family of states. So for example, ground states of some Hamiltonian. I will later go to excited states because you know ground states usually uh, don't have any chaos, right? So, and now, uh, I can think about these states as vectors, and there is a natural distance between two vectors. If you think about this as like you have a vector in space and then you slightly rotate the vector, these are unit vectors, right? A natural distance, uh, of course, there are some choices, but this is a uh, uh, very common choice. You just take one minus and you know, a scalar product of these two vectors, right? So if these vectors didn't rotate, this distance is zero. If you rotate a little bit, this distance will tell you how it's rotated. And then uh, you can see that uh, this uh, distance is strictly positive, right? Because overlap of two functions is less than one. So it means if I do a Taylor expansion, I should get something quadratic, right? Where chi should be uh, uh, positive or at least uh, semi-positive uh, uh, tensor. So uh, if you think physically about this distance, it's actually a probability to end up in excited state if you do a small quench, right? This is actually one of the standard problems you see in quantum mechanics. You have, I don't know, a square wall potential, you slightly change the volume, what's the probability that you remain in the ground state? What you do, you say initial wave function is the ground state of old Hamiltonian, then you compute overlap with the ground state of the new Hamiltonian, square it, and one minus this is the probability to be in some excited state. Right. So this is sort of the physical uh, <coughs> uh, meaning of this distance. And actually it was uh, distance, <coughs> this object is called quantum geometric tensor, and it was introduced by Provost and Vallée, oh sorry, there is a typo, Vallée, uh, 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 I think Google fixed my error, I apologize, to Wolf, uh, in, in 1980. Uh, and it's interesting that if you read their paper, uh, they basically say that, well, this is abstract object which is unrelated to measurements and so on, but it's still interesting to study. And then I'll mention that this object now appears everywhere. It's, it's like, uh, anyway. <clears throat> so now what is this object? Again, I'm skipping some steps, but you can easily convince yourself that, of course, this object, because it's, uh, this object, I mean, this distance quadratic in, in lambdas, it should involve uh, uh, two derivative of psi. And then it's easy to see that uh, this is a uh, um, connected part of the overlap of derivatives. Uh, again, why connected? Because uh, you can imagine that I 
uh, just do a phase rotation of my psi. So technically, it's a different state, but of course, we know that global phase rotation doesn't change anything. So distance will not uh, uh, be affected. And connected everywhere, uh, just remind you, probably many of you know, if I have connected parts, so suppose I have a alpha, a beta, zero, the same as derivatives connected, means that I, I subtract for the product of averages, right? So in mathematical language, it's the same as covariance. So that's what connected means. Right. So, and uh, then we just introduced, remember that uh, we said that uh, adiabatic gauge potentials I H bar times derivative operator. And then it's, uh, uh, well, immediately obvious that uh, 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 this tensor is nothing but the covariance of this adiabatic gauge potential. And then uh, remember we were writing that matrix elements uh, of uh, this gauge potential are, are given by first order perturbation theory. If you forgot, just uh, have a look uh, uh, in, into previous notes. And then if we combine it, we'll just get this uh, very nice expression. And here d by d alpha, I mean d by d lambda alpha. So here I'm assuming that my parameter could be in general vector. So I can have different couplings in, 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 in my Hamilton. Okay. So basically, uh, the bottom line that this fidelity, uh, this, this is geometric tensor, sorry, uh, which measures distance. So if, if you think about distance, uh, uh, it defines how quickly my wave function changes if I change the parameter. So that's what uh, uh, this distance and this metric tells me. And this is nothing but the covariance of this adiabatic gauge potential. So there is a part of this geometric tensor which I'm not going to talk about, but which probably most of you saw one way or another. This is imaginary part. And this is nothing but Berry curvature. It's interesting that Provost and Wally paper appeared in 1980 when they said that this is probably a physically irrelevant object. In 1984, there was a paper by Berry who introduced this. And if you heard about quantum hole, topological insulators, uh, and, and so on and so forth, this object plays like key role. It's like magnetic field in this coupling space, right? Uh, so it, uh, yeah, but as I said, uh, this is not relevant to what I'm going to discuss. But there is also a real part of this tensor, which was actually studied much less until recently. And a real part is called Fubini study metric tensor. It defines some Riemannian metric structure, basically distance structure. Uh, it defines quantum Fisher information. As I mentioned, this is also something which is, uh, I'm not going to discuss. It's probably more relevant to another workshop. Uh, but basically, uh, it's, it's uh, how much you can learn uh, about the system by measuring it. It's also contained in this object. It also defines speed limits, and it appears in many, many other contexts. So diagonal components of the metric tensor, if you want, if you have single parameter lambda, so they are called fidelity susceptibilities. So this name appeared a bit independently. Uh, but it sort of makes, this word makes sense uh, 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 because you know overlap of wave functions is fidelity and this is sort of susceptibility, right? So that's the reason for the name. So, and as I said, so these susceptibilities tell us how sensitive ground state to deformation. So you can imagine that uh, if you have a small gap in a quantum system, then uh, your ground state changes a lot. Just think about spin and magnetic field. Small gap uh, means that you have a small magnetic field, right? And if you start changing magnetic field, your state changes a lot. But on the other hand, if you have big gap, big magnetic field, you change it a little bit, nothing changes. So this tensor is small. And that's actually the reason why in, in previous expression there were energy denominators. So sensitivity of states is sensitive to gaps, right? To, 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 to small denominators. So it, uh, there was interesting a line of research when there was a very, very nice paper by Venuti and Zanardi already like you know, more than 15 years ago who suggested that you can use uh, 
uh, fidelity susceptibility as a sort of observable independent way to characterize quantum phase transitions. You get scaling and so on. Uh, and uh, I, I was involved in, in, in a work where we just defined geometry of phases of phase transitions, and there's, there's some interesting stuff there. But again, something we should be on this. So now we are interested in chaos ergodicity and we are interested in, in excited states. And so there is a natural way to define, uh, uh, to generalize this measure. We just take um, average over some ensemble of uh, this uh, 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 metric tensor. So before I was saying that let's consider the ground state, but now we can consider excited states. You can ask which excited state. Of course, we can consider just one state, but Usually, you know, you lose a lot of information when you consider one state. So let's consider state average objects. And then you can average with arbitrary weight. So this weight could be constant. Then you weigh all the states equally. Uh, you can choose some thermal ensemble, Gibbs ensemble. So this kind of biases between ground state, excited state. You can use some microcanonical ensemble. You can use any other ensemble. So I, in most results, I will show numerical results. We will use uh, 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 uniform average just to get more information about the system. So we treat all the states equally. So uh, yeah, this is kind of a Fisher information. And people often emphasize that this is quantum because uh, you take covariance in a given eigenstate. Uh, so for a given eigenstate, you subtract this product of averages and kind of this quantum and so on. But this is, uh, I mean, this, this uh, terminology is uh, not completely true. There is, again, very good classical anal analog of this object. So what you do, remember we discussed that this adiabatic gauge potential has uh, uh, a, a nice classical interpretation of a generator of canonical transformations which preserve uh, trajectory. And then if you want to take average over some ensemble, then in classical physics, we need to do average over phase space. Right? So trace corresponds to integral of phase space variables. Now, if we use some weights, which are, say, energy dependent, this will correspond to probability distribution, which is energy dependent. If we have square of some object, it will correspond to square of a classical object. Now, what is connected part? Connected part by basically means that you subtract infinite time average for a given point. So, um, and uh, this has a direct interpretation. So again, I, I kind of alluded to it a bit, but it's, it's a subtle point. And you have to think about it. Eigenstate, you can think about eigenstate average if you try to say, what is this object without eigenstates? This is nothing but infinite time average of A. So actually, this notion of this quantum Fisher information, it's defined in classical systems as well. I mean, of course, it could be different than quantum, but uh, there is nothing quantum about definition. And now I'm coming back to this picture, which I show for the third time, that uh, we will try to use uh, this object, which measures distance between states, to kind of differentiate between integrable, ergodic, and maybe some other regimes. So in the intuition, as I said, is, is very simple. If our state is messy, then it means it should be super sensitive, right? You, you know, like, you can imagine that, uh, you, again, so you think about this eigenstate as a classical trajectory, time average classical trajectory. So this trajectory is like super sensitive to anything, right? So it means if you change a little bit your potential, trajectory will become a mess. Totally different trajectory, right? On the other hand, if you have like a you know, square well potential and you move back and forth, you change a little bit, yes, you will get slightly different trajectory, but only slightly. So let's try to uh, use this logic and uh, see uh, 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 how it works. So, and now I will compare integrable systems and systems which satisfy ETH. So, systems which are ergodic, right, which are strongly chaotic. Sometimes people call it strongly mixing. Uh, and uh, we discussed, like yesterday, uh, what's the implications of ETH to, to uh, matrix elements and so on. So, now I'm going back to this 
uh, representation of this fidelity susceptibility. For now, I just assume that I have one parameter, so let's just look into fidelity susceptibility. Uh, so what we discussed yesterday. Well, remember we discussed this ETH or random matrix theory on that, that matrix elements, now I, I need square of matrix elements, uh, 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 they have this function f squared of omega, which corresponds to uh, uh, non-equal time response. Remember, we discussed it like Fourier transform of autocorrelation function. And you have suppression into, uh, of the matrix elements, like one over square root of Hilbert space size, which is e to the minus s over two, but when we square it, it's e to the minus s. So we see that denominator is very small, right? It's e to the minus s. S is entropy of the system. So one over e power s is roughly distance between sorry, density of states, which is very, very big, right, if, if I have a big system. But if you think what's the um, minimal energy denominator I have, well, it's level spacing, but it's exactly one over density of states, right, because density of states is number of states per unit energy. And this number of states is roughly inverse level spacing. Right? The more states I have within unit energy, the less the energy spacing. So it means that minimal energy is roughly e to the minus s. Of course, these are fluctuating numbers. I'm just doing estimates of scales. But now we see immediately that this intuition, which I was trying to, to argue for, it works. Because we see that fidelity susceptibility will be exponentially big, right? Because I have small denominator, numerator, but I have much smaller denominator. Energy difference square is e to the minus 2s. So if I pick just one term corresponding to smallest energy difference, I will already get e to the minus s, e power s, sorry. So we see that fidelity susceptibility uh, like scales like crazy in thermodynamic limit. It also scales like crazy in the classical limit because you remember this is absolute value of entropy. This is not like an, usually in thermodynamics only entropy difference. Uh, enters. So here we have absolute value of entropy. So this is something which diverges in the classical limit. So we see that this object is ill-defined in, in, in classical systems. And remember I mentioned in 1995, Gerzinski proved that uh, adiabatic gauge potential does not exist in classical chaotic systems. So this is sort of ETH proof of the same statement. He had more elaborate arguments, but it was before ETH anyway. So it looks like this object is physically irrelevant, but wait for a second. Of course, if something doesn't make sense, you need to fix this object and make sense of it. So on the other hand, uh, if you consider free models, like, you know, free fermions, uh, for many of you know this transfer fieldizing model, which maps to free fermions, free superconductor, or just any, I don't know, any band model, like uh, any model which is non-interacting, then it's again very easy to show you roughly your wave function is a product of wave functions in some space. Right? Could be momentum space, real space, some other space. And because of that, this A derivative is a local operator, right? Derivative of this product is sum of uh, uh, derivatives on active and individual entries. So this is a local operator. And if it's a local operator, if lambda is extensive perturbation, then this norm will be extensive. It's like for any quantity, like uh, variance of energy is extensive for this same reason, like variance of any other local quantity is extensive. So, and this is, you, we already see like difference at least between ETH models and free models. Then there are more complicated integrable models. Uh, may, maybe many of you heard about them. If, if not, uh, I don't know if there are any lectures on this. Uh, but basically, there are interacting integrable models. Actually, Tamash present here is, is one of the experts in, in, in uh, understanding them. And there are many examples of those. And uh, those still can be solved, but they are not simple free particle systems. You need to solve self-consistent complicated equations. And there, you can expect that maybe fidelity susceptibility is bigger because states are more complicated. They're not product slide but probably they're still not exponential. And here, let me just show first numerical result. It's, it's work was done with Mohit Pandey and, and these cells. And basically, this logic works very well. I just show scaling of fidelity susceptibility divided by L just for simplicity to remove this trivial extensive dependence. 
for three models. I'm not even writing Hamiltonians uh, because these results are sort of generic. But let me just say one is like fully chaotic. Again, by chaotic, I mean satisfying ETH ergodic. And then you look chi in the log scale. So this is basically a straight line means it's exponential scaling as a function of system size. And you see that, yes, fidelity susceptibility just blows up, right? So it goes by three orders of magnitude if I double the system size. Uh, if I have um, a free model, then actually there is simple analytic result and it saturates. I mean, it changes a little bit, but this is like boundary effect, which, which is very easy to capture. And if you have uh, this complicated integrable model, there is no analytic calculation as far as I know. Maybe it can be done, but numerically you just see very good agreement with a bit higher power law. So this is log scale, this is linear scale. So you see. At, uh, it's still polynomial in L. It's almost like L squared. We are not even sure it's in integer power. So it's probably L squared. Uh, uh, so it's a bit faster than free model, but still not exponential. Yes, this is a good point. So uh, I'll come to this later. But yes, so this lambda uh, is a perturbation which doesn't break integrability. So I basically deformed the Hamiltonian keeping it integrable. And this is actually very important. Y yes, yes, you're absolutely right. But I, I'll, yeah, I'll come to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's basically, a, uh, 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 but it, it's, it's a bit clear uh, uh, why this is important to deform. I take integrable model, I keep it integrable, then orbits are simple. If I take integrable model and make it non-integrable, I immediately start destroying my orbits. Right, so I will uh, make, of course, fidelity susceptibility much worse. So, but I'll come to this later. Okay, so now I, I want to spend like a you know, last uh, piece of analytics to, to load your heads completely. So I will try to connect now the sensitivity with real, with physics. Because right now I, I kind of implied that you can define uh, at least try to define this uh, adiabatic gauge potential in classical systems, like a generator of canonical transformation. Then I told you it diverges, right? So it doesn't exist for chaotic systems. Yes? Yeah. Well, for extensive perturbations, right? Uh, if you have a local perturbation, it will not even diverge if the system is integrable. Well, here, this spin chains don't have classical limit at all. I actually, we have some results for classical systems, but it's too much. I won't show them. So this is spin half chain. So here, yeah, uh, maybe I didn't emphasize it well enough. So if the system has a classical limit, then you can use at least standard uh, approaches to chaos, like Lapunov exponents with out of time order correlation function and so on. So yeah, there's something very important which I forgot to say. Classically, you can say that system with one degree of freedom or two degrees of freedom is chaotic or non-chaotic. Quantum mechanically, you cannot do it. If you consider a spin one half, it's a two by two matrix. How do you say it's chaotic or not? I mean, maybe you can consider ensemble of matrices, but that's ensemble of systems. So in order to say that quantum system is integrable or ergodic or whatever, you need to take scaling where Hilbert space size dimension goes to infinity. Chaos in quantum mechanics is asymptotic setting. In classical physics, you don't need to do it because in some sense, Hilbert space dimension is already infinite, even for one degree of freedom. But classic, uh, quantum mechanically, you have, say, two by two matrix. And there are two ways to do it. I mean, of course, you can come up with some intermediate maze, but two standard ways to do it. Once you keep number of degrees of freedom fixed, say, one or two, but increase local Hilbert space dimension. And that typically means you go to a classical limit large n, large s, whatever, small h bar, whatever, right? So, but there is another possibility that you increase number of quantum degrees of freedom. You make more and more spin one half. And in this case, or oh, more and more fermions. In this case, there is no obvious classical limit. At least if you map spin one half to spin classical spins, you will not correctly describe the system. But Hilbert space dimension uh, still increases. And uh, ergodicity you can define as a symptotic statement. As you increase Hilbert space dimension, you approach, for example, Victor Dyson statistics, right? 
And uh, usually this approach is very quick because Hilbert space dimension grows exponentially with number of degrees of freedom. So that's why numerically you can say the system is say integrable or non-integrable for a fixed number of spins, say 16, 18, 20, whatever people can do. But in reality, you can never say it uh, until you study asymptotic statement. Well, it's the same as thermodynamics. You know, when we say about, uh, talk about thermodynamics, we make statements about infinite volume, how we approach infinite volume, right? Uh, but in practice, of course, we never need infinity. So here uh, I uh, showed examples of spin one-half chains which do not have classical limits. So if you apply a TOC or whatever, you will not say that system is chaotic or not. But at least here you can reproduce this uh, uh, ergodic result. Okay, so now I will try to uh, make the final, uh, I would say, analytic connection of this adiabatic transformations and real-time response. Uh, so, and uh, there is a little bit of more mass involved, but it's very simple. So, if you remember, this was the uh, first result of first order perturbations. Here I just showed this slide before, right? So, this matrix elements of adiabatic gauge potential, like derivative operator, and they're given by this. But you, when you see a denominator, it's like rule of sum, you immediately think about time integral. If you didn't get used to this trick, you will see it in all Kuba derivations and so on. It's kind of called Lehman representation. Why? Because if you use Heisenberg representation, you put exponent here, you put e, e to the i h t Hamiltonian t o h bar, negative exponent here, right? And it will give you oscillating n minus a m. When you integrate it, you will get denominator. But then the only thing you have to keep in mind, whether you take a principal value or uh, you take a delta function, right? You all remember if you integrate e to the i epsilon x over x, you will get delta of epsilon plus one over epsilon. So one is principal part, one is this. So here we want the principal part of the integral. And this means that we need to take odd integral over time. And if you are not familiar with this, it's a very simple exercise. Uh, you just take oscillating exponent e to the minus, minus mu mod c times e to the i x t, x is energy difference. And uh, if you uh, have Oh, wait, wait, wait. So it should be sine t. I apologize. Oh, my mistake. Well, let me check it. Why? Sorry. I'm saying so much that you need to take odd. And I, I forgot the most important thing here. So this has to be odd integral to get principal value. So this is sine t. I don't know if, shall, shall I show it in the blackboard? Or do you believe it? Believe me. So actually, yeah, so it's basically saying that if you have e to the minus mu mod c times e to the i something minus e to the minus mu, mu t times e to the minus i something, you will get one over something. Mu is here is usually a small cutoff. So in principle, I need to send it to zero. But we are doing physics, not mathematics. So if you have some cutoff, let's actually make use of it later. OK, so and here, d lambda h of t is a Heisenberg representation of uh, operator. And the moment you have Heisenberg representation, something should click in your head that there is immediately classical limit for this. It's normal function. So if I think about what's d lambda h as a function of time, it's actually classically, it corresponds to this uh, function evaluated on time-dependent trajectory. So the moment I wrote this expression, you immediately see this has a classical limit. This is not obvious, right? It's some energy, it's a matrix element, who knows what it is. This has a well-defined classical limit. It just, I integrate my observable conjugate to lambda, Right. It could be in position, momentum, or whatever I want, uh, on, on the trajectory. And I basically do time averaging of this with the only difference that I kind of look into difference between positive time and negative time. Okay. So physical, and now actually, I can immediately uh, use mu for my advantage because I told you that if mu is zero, so basically if you take the limit, 
This is a classically exact generator of adiabatic, preserver, adiabatic uh, trajectory preserving transformation. But now, if I uh, keep mu finite, mu has a limit, uh, meaning of inverse time, right? So it basically cuts off my time. So then, this has a meaning of generator of preserving canonical transformations up to time one over mu. But this immediately should be clear. This should be well defined, right? Because the problem with chaos or whatever that my trajectory is crazy and I cannot undo any change because at infinite time it just do, does crazy things in chaotic systems. But if I only ask to do it up to finite time, then it should be doable. So, and now instead of taking mu equals to zero limit, I can study asymptotics. What happens when mu goes to zero? And suddenly mu becomes from just mathematical regularizer actually physical uh, parameter. Right. So then if you look into regularized uh, adiabatic gauge potential, the matrix elements, I'm going back uh, to this expression. So basically I'm undoing this thing, but now keeping mu finite. If you uh, do this integral, you will find the expression. So instead of one over E n minus M, I introduce short notation. Omega and M is like energy difference over H bar. So you will see this, right? So clearly when mu goes to zero, they become equivalent, but when mu is finite, it's something else. Okay. So what is then conserved operator? Remember we said that uh, this adiabatic gauge potential uh, comes with conservation law, which is basically derivative of my Hamiltonian plus uh, this rotation. And then it's another like simple exercise that it's actually same time average of this object, but now without sign. And actually, if you think about this, time average part of uh, d lambda h is exactly what is conserved. It's the part of d lambda h which didn't decay. And it's interesting that uh, sort of this trick numerically was, was uh, used by, by uh, Marcin Mijerevsky and uh, Peter Prilovchik and Tomasz present 2014. And they actually found uh, some missing uh, integrals in XXZ model. So it was like for some years people couldn't really make sense of numerics because something was missing uh, between analytics and numerics and it's clear that some conservation laws were missing. And they just used the, the trick to find them and then they found them analytically. So um, again, mathematically, it's kind of clear why it works, because if you take a uh, Heisenberg operator and do time average, only diagonal part of operator remains. And diagonal part is nothing but conserved part, right? So again, the question is how local it is and so on. Okay, so suddenly this object kind of makes sense. This G is just, as I said, time average part of the lambda H and A is like odd integral of this. Now let me try to connect dots together. So uh, actually, as I said, you probably by now should feel a bit overwhelmed. Uh, and this is sort of like many summary of the things I mentioned. So adiabatic transformations connect with conservation laws, connect with sensitivity of eigenstates, connect with long time response. Uh, this I will just emphasize in a second. They connect with ETH, they connect with integrability and so on. So this is like actually a good object which connects many, many different things together. And I also mentioned this is also what appears in I don't know, quantum annealing, counter diabatic driving. There are many, many other applications, actually dissipation, mass renormalization, so on. I can actually continue on this list. And once you go into that direction, you just realize that you, you can do many things. So <clears throat> now <clears throat> uh, let me uh, uh, again write expression for chi lambda, but now with cutoff mu, right? So I am basically showing the same formula as before, but instead of energy denominator squared, I have uh, what I, I wrote squared, right? So it's uh, energy different square over, over sort of this omega squared plus mu squared squared. Again, when mu goes to zero, it goes back to what we have, but clearly if mu is finite, I remove the problem of small denominators. So mathematically, it's clear that I, I regularize things. And then we discussed already uh, briefly, even though I, I didn't prove it to you, but I, I gave you a sketch how you get this expression, that 
this is nothing but the spectral function. Turns out if you are more careful, only symmetric part survives, uh, but you, you can see it. I mean, it has to be symmetric. So, um, and basically uh, this off diagonal matrix elements, I called it before like F lambda squared, but uh, it's more standard way to call it a spectral function. And this is nothing but the Fourier transform of symmetric correlation function. So symmetric correlation function is basically a memory, right? It just tells you how much of your observable at time t remembers of what it was at time zero. So it's a two point function. There are many names for this. And uh, again, I'm maybe assuming too much, but if you took like any solid state courses, many body courses, then you might know that this is the object which appears in dissipation. So when we write normal imaginary part of dielectric susceptibility, that's exactly what enters. When you compute Fermi golden rule rate, which is basically the same, it also enters and so on. So this is fluctuation and uh, sort of dissipation. And then uh, we see what happens when mu is small. When mu is small, essentially you're integrating spectral function divided by frequency squared up to cutoff mu. And then you see that because you divide by omega squared, you amplify low frequency or long time dynamics. So we see that adiabatic transformations know about long times. Even though I define them initially as a static object, you take eigenstate, you see how this eigenstate changes if I change my Hamiltonian. At the end, what I learn is what would system do at very long times. So and now we can sort of estimate uh, 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 what's going to happen. So uh, I imagine that my, uh, spect uh, my function phi of omega, the spectral function, has some shape. So now you see what happens. You take this spectral function, you divide by frequency squared, and you integrate from frequency roughly mu. So if phi does not go to zero with mu, then this is a divergent integral, right? Integral of one over omega squared is divergent. So then we can estimate this integral as phi of, of mu over mu. If my phi vanishes, If it vanishes at small frequencies, then you call it a spectral gap. It's very similar to a gap if you have a ground state. You know, if you have a ground state, there are no transitions uh, with energy less than delta. And for this reason, the spectral function, which remember is just off diagonal matrix element, is always zero, just because there is no states with this energy difference, right? So if my uh, function vanishes, if mu is small, then I can estimate this as phi of delta over delta. So it's mu independent, where delta is a spectral gap. So spectral gap is generalization of normal gap because we talk about all states, not just particular ground states. So it's kind of an average gap. Okay. So, and now, yeah, uh, I wanted to say something else. And So, um, and now from plots I just showed to you, if we have uh, ETH systems, there is no spectral gap. And this is also a result of random matrix theory. Remember, all of diagonal matrix elements are the same. This is actually a statement equivalent of saying that when frequency goes to zero, the spectral function goes to constant. On the other hand, in integrable systems, because adiabatic gauge potential does, oh sorry, fidelity susceptibility does not diverge. Uh, oh, this should be phi of delta over delta. Yeah, I think I was too many typos. So this is phi of delta over delta. So uh, because um, uh, my uh, fidelity stability doesn't diverge, I know that I must have a spectral gap, right? Because without spectral gap, it, this, this is divergent integral. So it actually means that uh, if my frequency goes to zero, 
uh, I shouldn't pick up any spectral weight. And again, this makes sense because integrable systems, they kind of have quasi particles or whatever. There are no transitions between exponentially close energy levels because system just doesn't know about exponentially dense spectrum, right? Uh, so this intuition also works uh, for classical motion. Remember, we discussed that classical integrable motion is a motion along tori. So you have one, you have another. If you have more degrees of freedom, you have one more. And uh, usually you have a, a, some frequency of motion for this tori. In order to get zero frequency, you really need to fine tune to a special point. So these frequencies generally depend on, on, on uh, where you are. So we do phase space average. But you can imagine that effective potential should be either quartic, and then you also need to fine tune to zero energy. Not only you need to find quartic potential, but also to fine tune to zero energy. Or potential can be of this shape, but then you need to fine tune to this reflection point. Then again, you will get zero frequency, infinite period, right? But again, you have to fine tune both the potential and the energy where you are. It's too much fine tuning. So, and it's intuitively clear that uh, uh, if, if I look into this classical motion, I will never see zero frequency if, if I have finite energy. So, and this intuition also works. So, and then there is another interesting fact, extremely interesting in my opinion, and uh, which is probably uh, not still explained, at least not to my knowledge. You can forget about all this quantum mechanics, eigenstates, adiabatic gauge potential, and so on, and just say, wait, I know what spectral function. It's long time response. And I know if I have a good thermalizing system, say I have local Hamiltonian here, but you can generalize to other situations, then I must satisfy diffusion equation. I look into observable, right? Here, suppose it's density, which corresponds to lambda being local potential, right? Then D lambda H will be density, local density. I know that this density at long time should satisfy diffusion equation, right? So, and diffusion equation, this is something we can all solve. It's like Schrodinger equation imaginary time. And then uh, we can go to Fourier modes. Let's say it's like some box, but uh, it doesn't matter. And then each Fourier mode will have exponential decay, right? So there is a difference between real time and imaginary time. Instead of oscillations, you have exponential decay, right? Then, of course, uh, if you sum many, many exponents, you can get anything like power loss and so on. But if you look into very long times, so times which are longer than what's known as Tauless time, it's basically time corresponding to the smallest momentum available, one over L. Right, so this time you might recognize L squared over D. It's the time to, to reach the boundary for diffusive process, right? Re propagate the square root of T and so on. Then if you look at this solution, all K which are big they disappear because all terms decay like crazy now, right? You have huge exponents. So in order to find asymptotic decay, you just choose smallest exponent because this Smallest k is exponentially decaying, but higher k is decaying even faster exponentially. So actually, you see that after a long time, and I just want to emphasize this time has nothing to do with level spacing. It's just completely classical time which doesn't contain even h bar. So after this time, this n of t decays exponentially. But now we can take Fourier transform of exponent, and Fourier transform of exponent, as we know, is Lorentzian. And actually, we see that phi of omega should be constant at small frequency. It's interesting that we arrive to the same conclusion as random matrix theory, as ETH, right? It tells us that spectral function should be constant small frequency. Without really uh, talking about quantum mechanics, microscopics, and so on, random matrices, and so on. And then you might say, well, maybe this is a coincidence. But it's interesting that this time, tau this time, is exactly the same time when random matrix uh, theory appears. And this is, I would say, observational result, at least to my knowledge. So when you define tau this time, for example, if, if you remember, it's when spectral form factor starts becoming linear, or when you start to see level repulsion. So it's like there are various tests. So when basically a Hamiltonian becomes like a random matrix. So it's, it turns out it's exactly the same uh, time, like uh, tau on, uh, uh, frequency or energy is one over this time. 
And then if you think a little bit more, so diffusion equation is really not special here. The exponential relaxation always appears in all kinetic type theories, right? When you forget the right master equation, you always write this exponential relaxation approximation. So then it's basically when bath becomes a bath, when you forget the memory. So, and any system, so it's not necessarily local, not necessarily one dimensional. The moment you can say, uh, 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 all other degrees of freedom act as a proper bus, so you forget all the memory, you get exponential relaxation. So it's broader than diffusion. And this exponential relaxation gives to, uh, 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 leads to a constant spectral function, the result of the random matrix series. So uh, even though I would say mathematically it's not yet completely clear, but at least physically uh, it's reasonably well established that random matrix theory is deeply connected with hydrodynamics to this kinetic theories and so on and so forth. Okay, so we see there are two completely complementary explanations for the same result. So now, instead of saying that my fidelity susceptibility is e to the s, so as I said, it's a result meaningless in the classical thermodynamic limit, I will say that I have an asymptotic result when my cutoff mu goes to zero, or one over mu time goes to infinity, my chi should behave as one over mu. So this is result for ETH, for ergodic systems. And one explanation, which is purely quantum mechanical or ETH, then matrix elements become energy independent. And another, I'm just repeating myself, but it's important, a diffusion, hydrodynamics, and so on, spectral function is constant. And it's the same Talens case. So it's actually, from this we find a very interesting conclusion which was actually confirmed numerically recently that long time diffusion hydrodynamics uh, 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 are closely connected, well this, this repetition. So in integrable systems, uh, uh, this long time diffusion and hydrodynamics only last until the system fills the boundary and then they have to stop. And maybe some of you heard that uh, recently, uh, actually uh, Tamash was again involved in, in some of this work and other people, they found that even in integrable systems you can observe diffusion and so on and there was like some controversies because people never expected that. But it turns out this is sort of like uh, a little bit of a fake diffusion because the moment you reach the boundary, the diffusion equation should break down. Because diffusion equation contradicts uh, uh, or at least is only consistent with ETH. It contradicts integrability. It contradicts the fact that fidelity susceptibility doesn't diverge. So hydrodynamic transport uh, in integrable models is more subtle. Okay, so now in the last part of, of my talk, Yeah, uh, you have to be careful. By spectral gap, I mean exponential spectral gap. So anything which is polynomial, I still consider a gap because we are talking about like you know very long times. But yes, so you have to be careful. So if you increase, if if you consider ground state, then you will get sort of similar stories, but you will get different powers of polynomials, and that's actually why fidelity susceptibility can be sensitive to critical points. Right? You have to be careful. So here, when I say uh, spectral gap, I only refer to exponentially closed level spacing. And actually, there are lots of open questions in, along this line, so I, 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 I don't want to pretend that we understand it. So now, in sort of the last part of, of this series, I want to study how ergodicity and, uh, emerges when we start breaking integrability. And there are some actually uh, interesting and, and unexpected results uh, which appeared. So this is numerics from the same paper with Mahit. So now I have to actually be careful uh, in, in, with respect to the question Lorenzo asked, which fidelity susceptibility I'm looking at. So what I want to do here is to look into fidelity susceptibility in the integrable direction, but in the presence of small integrability breaking perturbation. And here we consider two types of perturbations and then there are more papers with more types. They kind of look all the same. One is that we break integrability just on one side. 
it turns out you take a spin chain, which is integrable, you add magnetic fields on just one side in the middle, it shouldn't be boundary, and you break integrability. Another possibility, you take this chain, which is integrable, you can, basically integral means you can solve Schrodinger equations, very complicated solution, but it exists. You can find eigenstates. Uh, and then you add, say, second nearest neighbor interactions, and this also breaks integrability. This also leads to ETH. But now, and this was checked, I mean, people know that you get random matrix statistics and so on, but now I want to add this term, which is very, very small. So what's, what's happening, right? Remember, we were discussing that if you have s classical systems, nothing really happens. I just I address conservation laws, but roughly I get same nice orbits and so on. So let's just look into Fidel's susceptibility. Again, it just highlights sensitivity of eigenstates. There are no canonical transformations here because it's really quantum system. So, and then uh, if my integrability breaking perturbation is zero, I just recover result I showed. So this is polynomial dependent. But then if I break integrability by very, very small num number, this is like 10 to the minus three, I, I see like extremely sharp crossover from this integrable behavior to like exponential behavior. Moreover, the slope seems the same. Of course, this is numerical result. Uh, you, you cannot make very strong claims, but at least slopes are nearly parallel, right? So you break integrability in the same way. And you break it at tiny, tiny perturbation. Like for this system sizes, I don't know, uh, 10 to the minus, it's two times 10 to the minus four. It's a very small number. So at this number, you will not see a, even traces of ignorance in statistics. Uh, uh, the system is too small for that. So um, uh, in this sense, like fidelity stability is very good. And this is natural. It's sensitive to very long times. And when you ask yourself how you feel integrability uh, breaking uh, in the physical system if it's small, well, you have to look into long times. Because obviously, if you break it a little, you cannot get strong Lyapunov exponents right away. Right? So. What we see is that a transition from sort of integrable to chaotic behavior is very sharp. Um, and of course, chi is like very sensitive probe. It's very good. So um, uh, we need exponentially, at least within numerics, right? So I don't want to make very strong claims. Small in the system size perturbation to break integrability. So it's basically tiny. But then uh, there is a very big surprise when Mahit first found this result. So we saw that, okay, we are done. This is integrable, this is ergodic, ETH. But if you carefully examine the slope, of course, it's hard to do visually, but you have to trust uh, me, then this slope is two times bigger than what you expect from ETH. So actually, what you find is something crazy. So this regime is more chaotic than ETH regime. More chaotic in the sense that your eigenstates are less stable. So you change, you add a little bit of uh, integral perturbation delta, and your eigenstates change much more. So first, we were totally surprised. But of course, after everything I, I kind of explained to you, it actually looks very natural. So and it turns out that this e power 2f scaling is actually maximal possible. So it's not only slope is two times bigger. It actually saturates the upper bound. And the reason, if you remember, this fidelity susceptibility is matrix element squared over a square of energy denominator. But for local operator, matrix element squared, it cannot be bigger than one. So one is the upper bound. It basically means that instead of this e to the minus s over two suppression, your you matrix element kind of sits on nearby states. Uh, and then when it's one, you get energy denominator s squared. It's e to the power two s. So e power two s is the largest uh, possible one. So what's going on? Well, let's just look. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but again, you have exponential dependence on the system size. The bigger the system size, the smaller perturbation you need to add. But yes, yes, yes. So if you have finite system size, there is a threshold. I mean, if I take, have 10 sites and that perturbation 10 to the minus 100, nothing can happen because I have finite gap in my states. Again, this all statements are on average. So you have to be a, a bit careful how we average things, but 
let's module with this. Uh, yeah? Uh, to be honest, I forgot. They looked identical. I, yeah, basically very similar result. I, 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 I should know, but I forgot. Uh, uh, so um, now, well, we related uh, chi to the spectral function. This is physical response. And I, I kind of told you that in integrable systems, it should vanish, right, at small frequencies. In, in ergodic systems, it's saturate. But now when we have small integrability breaking, what happens is this weight, so this is like solid lines, it does opposite, it increases. So this is again, dashed line would be integrable. And then if you increase system size from 12 yellow to 80 in blue, you get less and less weight. This is your spectral gap. I mean, it gets smaller and smaller, you might see the spectral gap. But again, this is uh, the important thing that this thing that vanishes with frequency, so integral converges. Anyway, so um, everything is consistent. If you extrapolate, it will keep vanishing forever, right? So, but if you look into small integrability breaking, you see that actually weight increases. It's not a constant, it does opposite. So, but then if you think about this for a second, this actually makes perfect sense. Because when I said that spec there is a spectral belt in integrable uh, models, I actually didn't tell you a complete story. There is also a delta function peak, which are called through the way, and they correspond to conservation laws. Because the fact that integrable systems don't relax means that observables, which are supposed to decay to zero, according to thermal equilibrium, they actually don't decay to zero. They have memory. And memory means you have infinite time response, and infinite time response means you have a delta function in frequency space, right? Fourier transform of a constant. So, and they don't contribute connected correlation functions, right? They don't contribute fidelity, susceptibility, and so on. But the moment I break integrability, I start broadening this response. This is a log scale. So this looks like a big scale, but in, if you consider not a log scale, this will look like a you know, broadened peak, broadened delta function peak. And so what's the physics behind? Well, the physics is called pre-thermalization. Because if I have integrable system, I relax to some non-equilibrium state where I have some extra conservation laws. When I break integrability a little bit, these conservation laws start to decay. And you can imagine that this would be a super slow process. And because you have super slow processes, you must have a lot of spectral weight. And then, as I explained to you, this means that it's very hard to do canonical transformations or unitary transformations. Your eigenstates are super fragile. Okay, so uh, a little bit more numerics, and, and then I, I do another piece of analytics. So uh, then, uh, actually, we collaborated with serious people like Marcos Regal, but uh, to be honest, the, uh, most of the work was done by, by, at the time, his student, Tyler LeBlanc. It's really fantastic. Uh, so we considered already serious system sizes and so on. I, I was just admiring uh, how they do numerics. I didn't contribute to this project much otherwise. Uh, so, uh, so we consider basically same integrable spin chain, but now we have second nearest neighbor interactions. And then, you know, Marcus is very careful. You put, make sure all couplings are incommensurate. There are no accidental degeneracies. So you take these crazy numbers, like golden ratio, for the coupling to make sure that uh, there is no accidental resonance between something and something. Anyway. And then we also consider small integrability breaking perturbations. And now what we look into uh, different fidelity susceptibilities, but now uh, in the broad range of integrability breaking perturbation. So again, it's a log scale. These are two different observables. So uh, I only added two graphs because there are different inserts, but let's just focus on the top graph. So what we do, we divide uh, chi, this fidelity of the ability, over the ETH value. So ETH value, think about this as e power s, but this removes like all finite size effects. And then when integrability breaking perturbation is relatively large, you see that curves, different curves are different system sizes. Well, they're not shown here. 
oh, okay, largest is 24, smallest is 18. So there are much bigger system sizes now. So uh, what you see that you start getting this collapse. And this is what is consistent with ETH. So chi has this E power S scaling, you have collapse and so on. And what you see is that indeed if the system size increases, your ergodic region gets bigger and bigger. But there is also this part. So if you are integrable, we would expect this fidelity suitability. If you remember, uh, larger system size should be smaller because we divide by typical ETH. I showed this result in the previous plot. So we see we go to the, uh, very small perturbation like 10 to the minus four, but we are not there yet. So what we know that this is a crazy chaotic regime because chi like grows here faster than in ETH, right? It keeps growing. So this, uh, we see that this is a whole region which is much more chaotic, much more predictable in terms of eigenstates and, and so on than ergodic. And actually uh, to keep the analogy with my uh, uh, blue ink, you might think it makes sense because uh, there are different definitions of maximal chaos and I'm not insisting on this one, but let me just say that weakly non-integrable systems are actually less predictable. So I, mean, I actually know it from practice. We get like, you know, hurricane, hurricanes, turbulence or whatever when we have uh, 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 small viscosity, right? We are almost integrable. If I consider um, blue ink, then uh, if I'm strongly ergodic, uh, like it strongly mixes, right? After a while, I have a very predictable state, like a uniform blue color. But imagine I'm weakly ergodic. You will get this intermediate time uh, uh, pattern, which is strictly speaking, is less chaotic than uniform color. I have less entropy, but try to predict it. You will not be able, it's very susceptible, it's very unstable, right? So it's actually, we know from practice that what this little uh, stupid plot shows up is actually what's happening. If you break integrability, you are more chaotic weakly. You are more chaotic than if you break it strongly. You cannot describe uh, 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 your system with simple equations. So what we also find from this plot that very good scaling of the speakers e to the uh, minus 2s. And what we see that the onset of ergodicity grows, uh, goes down very quickly with system size. So this uh, kind of is an exponential feat, but I don't want to, to make strong claims. Uh, so this uh, critical coupling, before I was talking about coupling here, when you start to see chaos. So this grows even faster. So, but this also seems to grow exponentially, but it could be high order polynomial. But at least we can rule out weak polynomials. It, data could be consistent with one over L cube or one over L to the fourth or higher. Or it's also consistent with exponential. There is no theory of this as far as I know. So, uh, right. So then, uh, yeah, I'm not going to talk about many body localization here, though I, I, I uh, pretty convinced now that this was really a big mistake and I can explain uh, why, but uh, here is just the result that what happens if you take a disordered model, I mean, for those who know it's Anderson insulator and add small interactions, and basically the story that nothing really changes. You still see that uh, these systems become as quickly ergodic as, as any other system. So this is not regime most people study, this is regime of where all parameters of the order of one, but anyway, so uh, there is a clear contradiction to MDL claims. Anyway, so uh, uh, this is kind of an, uh, a mini summary of this part, and then hopefully I'll have some time for, for uh, uh, even newer results. So um, this is kind of schematic diagram, which seems to apply to all systems, quantum, classical, uh, and so on. We have some classical results, which I'm not showing, but they're completely in line with this. So basically, I mean, instead of system size of classical systems, of course, you want to have something like one over each bar or, or if you approach classical limit. Uh, uh, so, um, uh, of course, if integrability breaking perturbation is very small, the system is integrable. If it's big, generically expect a TH. Uh, and in between, there is this maximal chaos where, as I said, we basically have least predictive power about the system in the long times. Classically, it means that our trajectories are most unstable. So there is no way I can undo this. Quantum mechanically, our eigenstates are most unstable. So we cannot really say much about the system, neither in deterministic nor in statistical sense. 
Uh, and actually many mistakes uh, uh, were done, and this was of course very subtle, we didn't expect it, we were very surprised. Because many people like we developed renormalization group approaches and so on when you have a direct transition from integrability to ergodicity. And you free examine these papers, they are all incorrect. Uh, there is no, this direct transition is impossible. And again, the reason is just the stupid broadening of delta function pre-thermalization and so on. This long time dynamics is expected. So once you connect the dots. Okay. So. Uh, Which exponent? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this, this is totally unrelated to this as far as I can say, or maybe I don't know how it's related. So that's why I want to say, I mean, I use maximal chaos for like short uh, brevity. Like my people might disagree. This system have tiny Lyapunov exponent. So this uh, systems with large Lyapunov exponents, I would say they are fastest thermalizing systems but they are more predictable in a sense I mentioned, right? So again, this terminology. So these are maximal chaos in the sense of maximally uh, uh, um, uh, sensitive eigenstates. You can basically define Lyapunov exponent in space, how sensitive you are to eigenstates if you change space, and then you have exponential sensitivity. Uh, or you can define ex uh, exponential sensitivity of stationary trajectories to time. And then this will be like two time mu. Uh, again, this is maximum, but these are not the of exponent. How to connect the two, I, I still have no idea. I mean, we, it's not true. We have some ideas, but I don't know which ideas are correct, if any. Uh, so I maybe spend uh, 10 minutes to show one uh, uh, you know, last for, for the series of lectures, analytic construction, where we can see how these integrals of motion are destroyed. I remember I, I, in the very first lecture, I showed how we have two-dimensional oscillator. We do perturbation theory. We get improvement for the integrals of motion. But then I kind of implied that, oh, there is uh, chaos, uh, which appears in classical quantum systems almost immediately. So local integrals of motion do not exist. Even when the system is, I just want to highlight, is still not ergodic. So chaos appears much before ergodicity. And uh, we were able to do this uh, analytically, completely at least, in the one setup. Actually, there is a series of related setups. And there I will kind of show, because this divergence of um, uh, integrals of motion is actually related to another hot topic, which is studied now, operator spreading. Maybe you've heard Krylov complexity, Lanchos coefficients, like all this stuff. So, and there is like, there are very interesting connections between this stuff and that. So let me just illustrate this. So uh, the model which we were able to solve is when you have some system, so it doesn't really matter what it is. It doesn't have to be spin chain. It could be some classical chain. Let's call it bus, which could be integrable, non-integrable, and so on. Then we have the probe spin. Actually, exact same construction works if you have a probe photon, and this will be a Floki problem, probe oscillator. Uh, and then we weakly couple it. And then what we want to do is to ask if the magnetic field, I call it V, it's like potential, but you can think about this magnetic field is very big, how exactly this uh, uh, almost conserved operator, so it's clear that V is very big and I have small system, my magnetization will be conserved, right? Because I have strong magnetic field, so spin will not relax. But then I want to ask how this uh, conserved operator relaxes uh, or gets dressed if I uh, make this system bigger and bigger. So, and here uh, uh, it looks like a different problem. I'm now looking for uh, a local integral of motion, which commutes with the Hamiltonian, which is adiabatically connected to SZ. But I probably hope I convinced you that this is equivalent to finding adiabatic gauge potential with respect to V. This uh, Q is nothing but this G which I introduced, which is V lambda H plus I. So it's a completely equivalent problem, right? So, and now I will try to use perturbation theory in one over V to find a better integral of motion. The idea that when epsilon is zero and V is infinity or both, uh, or oh, sorry, either of them satisfied, uh, this Q is just SZ, it's conserved, right? My magnetization. So for Floquia systems, it will be photon number. 
But then I want to write an expansion that this is like S Z naught plus one over V times some other correction plus one over V squared times other correction and so on. And then what I want to, I, I need to solve again a very simple equation, but with commutator, simple equations sometimes have complicated solutions, sometimes no solutions. So I basically want to have that next order integral commuting with large term, which is S Z naught, should be canceled by previous order integral commuting with Small term, right? So this is standard perturbation theory. And let's see how it works. So in the first order, it's easier. Because in the first order, uh, my Q1 commuting with SZ0 should be the same with my Q0, which is SZ0, commuting with epsilon H in, right? It, does, it commutes with H pass, because H pass lives here, Q0 lives here, so they obviously commute. Now you stare at this equation and say, oh, I solved it. Q1 is epsilon H in. So you actually now what you did, you found a better conserved operator. You said to the first order, it's zero order, it's SZ0, but to the uh, next order, you just add some spin-spin uh, coupling. Then you want to continue, but it turns out that you can continue, at least we could continue, only to the linear order in epsilon, because in order to solve this equation, you need to... Uh, uh, there is some technical stuff which I'm not going to expect, you, uh, explain. You need uh, this interaction to be odd under sigma z, which actually, uh, I mean, if you know, if I put sigma x or sigma y here, then I will satisfy this condition. So if you dress sigma x and sigma y with sigma z, you will get minus the same. Uh, anyway, it's, it's some technical part. But the point is that in, to the leading order in epsilon, all these commutators which start to appear, they're all uh, remain odd, so I can continue this series. Anyway, with this caveat, which I'm sure is unclear, but if you write this equation, try to solve it, you will see it in five minutes, you can actually write the full solution. It's linear in epsilon in my coupling. Oh. Yeah, okay, wrong button. So it's linear in epsilon, and it's a very simple sum of nested commutators. So I have a nested commutators of my coupling to the bus with bus Hamiltonian. So all information about convergence or divergence of this series is connected in this nested commutator. And those who know this is what builds your Krylov space. So now we can stop at n's order and ask how good I am. So I want to ask uh, what is the norm of my commutator with H? You remember we want it to be zero. Right, that's how iteration works. And then we actually find an analytic answer. So you get V power to N plus one, just because this is our small parameter. Each order contains one over V. And then all nested commutators cancel except for the last one, right? Because I stopped in N's order. So you get one nested commutator. So there is like a short notation of Liu Willen, but basically this means uh, I take commutator with H in, 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 to N plus one times. So now I can estimate mistake, and this mistake has a physical meaning. It's basically a lifetime of my operator. If you do short time expansion, and it's clear if observable commutes with Hamiltonian has infinite lifetime, it doesn't decay. If it does not, then it decays. So a square, it's not lifetime, sorry, it's decay rate. So decay rate is the sense commutator. And then uh, uh, what you see is that the result is that we have this nested commutator divided by V power of so we actually have very simple criterion of when chaos doesn't happen. This doesn't tell you about ergodicity yet, but it tells you about chaos. At least it tells you when you can have uh, uh, good con conserved integrals of motion. And in particular, if I deal with finite dimensional matrices, uh, of course, this all norms are bounded. So at large, we, I'm, the procedure works. So I, I, I can... Uh, I can dress my integral of motion. But if I deal with a generic local interacting systems, I wrote 1D, but basically a dimensionality doesn't matter. Then uh, to our rescue, there was a paper, several papers actually. The first one was by Berkeley group, uh, Hood Altman's group in 2019. It's, it's a very, very nice paper. But then there were some follow-up papers by uh, the Marsky collaborators, Cow, and so on, they actually figure out, they solve this problem, how these nested commutators behave, and they actually grow factorially. And at the end, it's actually, there is very rigorous math behind a very simple statement. 
If when I consider a nested, suppose I have a local operator. When I consider a nested commutator with Hamiltonian, I increase its support. First, the one size spin, then two spins, three spins, and so on. So each time, my norm, of course, increases exponentially because each time I add say coupling J, I multiply by J, right? But on top of that, I increase number of sides. So each time I multiply by extra K, and this gives you factorial. So of course, they have much more serious, rigorous work which kind of justifies that and so on. So in what we see, like the bottom line of this, that for local interacting models, and it doesn't matter whether they saw it or non disor it, then uh, this expansion is asymptotic. So we can only do it up to a certain order. And after a certain order, we have to stop. So we can get good integral of motion, but not infinitely good. And you can ask how good we can get. Well, you just uh, uh, look into uh, you just look into best order. So basically, when this norm stops decreasing, and again, it's a very simple calculation. It's factorial versus exponent, and you will find that best order will give you exponentially small gamma and v. So you get very, very good um, integral of motion, which has exponentially long lifetime in v, but it's not infinite. Okay. So. In this very last part of the talk, I will show actually results which just appear today, and these are kind of uh, really nice pictures. So the title of the work which uh, Hyun Jing, whose student, uh, came up uh, is, is, is integrability is attractive. And I mean, for some people it's attractive in a static sense, but it's actually attractive in geometric sense and maybe in dynamical sense. So I, I don't have much time, so let me just really try to explain what's going on. So we kind of try to understand um, uh, still the whole thing, so what happens with Kao's ergodicity near integrable points, but now we want to really carefully look into the full metric, not just one direction like this or that, but the whole metric tensor. So this is the model. Uh, I'll maybe show a couple of models. Uh, so this is uh, the same uh, transverse fieldizing model, which is integrable. I mentioned it many times. And then this longitudinal field breaks integrability. And then there are actually two interesting results. So I don't want to overwhelm you, but basically one of the results that this whole transition to chaos seems to satisfy scaling theory. So this is like second order phase transitions. It's universal. And the second result that uh, 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 you can find integrable regions by following sort of geodesics in the metric space. And I'll, I'll try to, to uh, now translate what I said to, 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 to the results. Anyway, so I just, now I'm coming back to, to um, uh, Lorenzo point. So now let me take an integrable point. So when h is equal to zero, this is free model. And look into fidelity susceptibility, but with respect to integrability breaking perturbation. And then uh, actually uh, 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 this um, quantum language is very convenient because we know that if it's integrability breaking, it kind of defies all selection rules. Like an integrable case, I have many uh, conserved operators and so on. So I defy all selection rules. If I defy all selection rules, again, I expect spectral function to be constant. Just because the small matrix elements, I mean, closed by energies, not closed by energies, who cares? I open all the gaps uh, with the same roughly rate. So it actually means that we expect that fidelity susceptibility is still one over mu. This ETH scaling, even though the system is integrable, but I'm looking into non-integrable direction. Now, what happens if uh, we look into uh, transverse direction, uh, so look, integrable direction? Well, we know that when h is equals to zero, I just said that spectral function must go to zero, so which means that chi is a constant. But now uh, I'm skipping some steps, but you can say, let's assume that h is very, very small, like arbitrary small. I said perturbation theory doesn't work, but say h is equal to e to the minus 10 million power of 10 million, right? Then perturbation theory will work. And then uh, uh, what happens that you can apply perturbation theory and this small h will induce transitions by g because this small h will lift the selection rules which were before. And so then you can convince yourself that spectral function will be h squared, remember it's square of the matrix element, divided by energy denominator squared, which is frequency. So, and then you translate it and you see that susceptibility is h squared over mu cube. So it's small, but it grows much faster. And so now we see uh, 
two interesting things. First, both of them kind of suggest same scaling form. Again, how you usually find scaling form. You first find it perturbatively and then try to check whether it goes beyond perturbation. So, so the both results can, go, can be uh, cast in the form that chi is one over mu times function of h over mu. H is integrability breaking perturbation, right? It works in both cases. Okay, sorry. Getting tired. Almost done. So, and then, uh, oh, now I'm too fast. So, and now we get like another interesting result that uh, if we think what's the minimal direction of uh, chi, so where the wave function changes least, then when h is very small, minimal direction is parallel to integrability. I say mu g, but it's parallel. On the other hand, you just see because of the reason I mentioned that um, uh, uh, this has much stronger dependence on mu uh, than, uh, 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 yeah, did I, I probably again messed up. Anyway, so uh, when h is too small, uh, as I said, integral, when, oh, and that's probably correct. When h becomes big, so at critical value, basically h equals to mu, they switch. So this is probably good. And actually now minimal direction becomes orthogonal to integrability. It points towards integrability. And again, actually, the reason behind is uh, um, physically very, very expected. So um, uh, we already discussed that um, in integrable systems, I have spectral gaps. And basically, it means that I don't have small uh, long time dynamics. Like phi of omega is small at small frequency. But if I break integrability, Actually, my delta functions start to broaden. I start getting pre-thermalization. So instead of slow dynamics, I'm getting uh, fast dynamics. I'm getting very slow dynamics. But orthogonal direction, it was kind of slow from the beginning, but nothing changes to it. So, and this is indeed what happens. I, 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 I know it's a bit overwhelming, but this are my last three slides, so I, I apologize if, if it's too much. I, I didn't have the time to simplify it. But this basically slide to show that Indeed, scaling theory seems to work for the transition. So we plot uh, product mu times chi, which is, should be a function of h over mu. And these are different system sizes. And what you see that if you increase system size, you get bigger and bigger region of collapse. And you are already like in non-perturbative regime. So it seems that all crossover almost all the way to maximum. So remember, after the maximum, you start getting ergodicity. It's described by scaling theory. So at least there is a good numerical evidence that uh, 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 emergence of chaos is universal. So it's sort of like integral points are like critical points, uh, but we look into infinite temperature. Then uh, the other thing we can see is this the same plot, but we don't rescale horizontal axis. Now it's plotted against H, not H over mu. This is physical magnetic field. And there, if we look carefully, we see in the same as in the plot I showed with Tyler that there is a growing region of ergodicity. Remember, ergodic regime, chi mu should go to constant. And then uh, uh, what you see that if you basically make mu lower and lower, which you can only do if you increase system size in parallel, uh, but anyway, this is again another subtlety, what you see that this ergodic region, when you have a collapse, gets bigger and bigger. So we see in this model, everything is expected. You have chaos, which appears very, very early on, right? And then we have ergodicity, which appears later. Uh, both go to zero. One is faster than another, but again, we don't have quantitative statements. So, um, so now what's the physics? And I already explained the physics, but here you can sort of see it with numeric. So now we look into autocorrelation function. So this is exactly what you would measure in experiment. Or maybe you can use measure Fourier transform. This is your memory function. And what happens is uh, exactly what I described in words. So if you look into solid lines, which is orthogonal direction, you see relatively fast dynamics. I mean, you don't see diffusive tails and so on because systems are too small. But if you look into parallel direction, so this is again small but not too small integrability breaking, you start to see super slow dynamics. And this is your pre-thermalization. So this glassy slow dynamics, which is behind all these divergences, you just see in the parallel direction. So there is some subtlety that if you go a little bit from integrability, you have to decide what's parallel direction. 
but you can decide it by, by minimizing and maximizing time. So we actually see uh, like what's physically going on. So in um, uh, this uh, minimal chi directions are actually directions of slow, slowest relaxation. So they are actually extremely natural. Uh, so there is another model, maybe I skip because I think it's too much. Uh, let me just say in words, so that there's some amazing result we found. So this is my opinion. Uh, uh, so it's a model where we break integrability only in the boundary. So the system is integrable, we have boundary. And said from the point of view of chaos, it looks the same. But when you look uh, into the same plots and uh, look what happens with ergodicity, you see a totally different story. So now if you look into the same plot for that model, so you look into mu chi, and you see that if you increase, uh, decrease mu, it's kind of increased system size, you see never, you never see collapse. So it's actually, this is an indication that system never satisfies ETH, even when integrability breaking is small. So this is like an example of a system which seems to satisfy KM. This is probably not too surprising after you think, because even though this is extensive system, because you break integrability on the boundary, you feel it's kind of like zero dimensional. So in order to say, for, for particles to thermalize, they need to travel to the boundary, come back, scatter here, uh, then travel, come back, and so on. So it looks from this point of view, it's almost like a zero dimensional system. Can you speak louder, sir? No, no. So this way, you will not get Wigner Dyson, uh, nothing. So this is one of indicators, but none of them. So uh, basically, uh, what, what, what you see uh, is that um, uh, this scaling of mu chi, which increases as you lower mu, it really tells you that spectral function is never flat. And these results I want to highlight, they are in thermodynamic limit. So because it's a dynamic limit, our time cutoff is finite. We cannot go to lower cutoff. It's like infinite time versus infinite space. We decided to go to infinite time. But uh, this is X, X, Z chain. Okay, since you asked, I, I. So this is X, X, Z chain with boundary magnetic field on one side, which doesn't break integrability. And with last link, which is different from one. And it turns out that when G is one, this is XXZ chain with boundary magnetic field, which is integrable. When G is zero, it's also integrable. The last link doesn't exist. In between, the model is supposed to be chaotic. It's sort of a random choice. I mean, it's not that we looked, we thought, okay, let's try to have two parameters where we break integrability close to the boundary. We just and for a long time, I actually started writing the paper thinking that, oh, it's similar, it's similar. But then, so no, no, it's not similar. So this, this is an example of the model where we see no traces of Wigner Dyson statistics or ETH whatsoever. So I cannot rule out that if you go to some crazily small time, something happens. But these asymptotes are very convincing. So in the sense that uh, what, what you see is that if you do mu squared chi, this is kind of maximal possible scaling of chi then the scaling works reasonably well. Again, I don't say it's perfect, but it works reasonably well. When you try ergodic scaling, ETH scaling, it just does not work for any parameter. It's actually, we see exact same story for classical systems where there is a KM, and which is supposed to be never ergodic. I mean, there are some whatever, spin models which are never ergodic. We see the same story. So in this sense, this, that's a kind of good indicator to show, see that the model is always chaotic, but is never ergodic or at least within numerical, whatever precision is never good. I have two minutes left, so let me just show a nice picture. So for justifying the title of the paper, integrability is attracting. So what we show here is really uh, directions of smallest metric. Uh, so these are basically geodesics, loosely speaking. And then the interesting thing is that, this is for this model which the man said, that you can identify integrability regions even if you don't know them. So fr from basically this adiabatic flows, minimal direction flows, they uh, bring you uh, towards integrability. And then, and this is of course finite size effect, so we expect that if you go to infinite size, this becomes sharper and sharper. And actually I explained why it becomes sharper and sharper. 
So one can say, oh, this is a nice geometric result, but how this is relevant to physics? Well, first of all, I told you that these directions are actually directions of fast relaxation. So basically, if you have I know, some coupling manifolds and you look into conjugate observables which relax faster and you just follow this direction, so basically you move in that direction, modify Hamiltonian, check again which direction you need to follow, update it, go and so on, you will end up in integrable system. But then this is already at the level of speculation, but it's last slide, so I, I, I hope you will forgive me, that I would say that actually dynamically systems want to tune themselves to this point. Imagine that my external fields are not external fields, but dynamical variables. So then actually directions of orthogonal, it's directions of strongest dissipation, strongest mass, and so on. This is a direction, you can kind of imagine that what sludge metric means. It means I have huge reconstruction of wave function. Now think about the Polaron. So if I have a Polaron with big mass, what it means? It's just dressed by many, many atoms, like electron. It's very hard to move. Now you ask dynamically where the polar, Polaron will move in orthogonal direction. Right? It happens with you also, right? If you I don't have a path and there is an easy direction, in, uh, one is easy direction, one is hard, you always follow uh, easy direction. So in some sense, uh, this is kind of an interesting uh, 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 point, and then this is on the level of speculations that even though integrable po points or lines are measure zero, they're actually attractive for nature. And of course, we have many examples where the systems are nearly integrable around us. Whether it's for this reason or not, I don't know. So this is my last slide. I'm a bit over time. So this is basically what uh, sort of colloquial picture, it, it, uh, just to finish what, what I was telling you. So in a way, like I would argue that integrability lines are kind of like river basin. So if I have a loose uh, analogy, so we have rivers, which are integrable lines, then we have mountains, which are chaotic regions. Then our adiabatic flows, uh, like streams, they go towards the rivers all the way, and then they turn and go parallel to the rivers. That's exactly what adiabatic flows are. And then they end up in some points, and these are usually high symmetry points, which sort of like vortices and so on in this geometry. So yeah, there is, it seems to be also extremely interesting geometry. I just showed the metric, but metric defines metric manifold. I even uh, um, we have some collaborations with um, actually two people in the audience, uh, Rustem and Anastasia. Maybe it will lead to some results, but it's clear that geometry uh, is, is uh, encoded as metric uh, tensor is very interesting. Okay, so I'm done. So let me give you kind of a summary of what we discussed during these three lectures. Uh, and uh, I remind you that we discussed kind of circular relation between chaos and determinism. Chaos leads to determinism, determinism leads to chaos, and uh, there is uh, it's kind of in and yang relation between, uh, between them. We also talk about emergent uh, random matrix theory, each age description of ergodicity. Uh, uh, it could be strong chaos, mixing, or whatever. I, I don't think terminology is completely settled now. Uh, in quantum systems, and from this you have emergent thermodynamic relations. Then uh, in the last part of this lecture, I, we discussed that classical and quantum chaos ergodicity can be understood through complexity of trajectory, or basically adiabatic transformations which preserve uh, trajectories. And uh, maximal chaos in the sense of sensitivity, and argued actually in intuitive sense as well, actually very close to integrability, uh, not, not when the systems are ergodic. Then uh, in, in the very last part, like I mentioned that it seems, again, I don't want to make strong statements because so far this is just numerics and some perturbative results, but it seems that uh, emergent chaos like, satisfies some scaling relations and uh, uh, from the point of view of geometry and possibly dynamics, actual integrability is attractive. It's like a fixed point. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm here until tomorrow afternoon, so if you have any questions, please talk on.
yeah, so like in, in this MDL systems, it seems what people thought is localized phase is actually a glassy phase with this. So if you have translational invariance, then um, I mean, there is no reason for slow spatial dynamics, uh, but you have uh, slow dynamics, for example, in momentum space. That's what actually happens in Fermi pasta Ulam problem, which is classical. You have super slow dynamics of occupations of normal nodes. Uh, so it probably depends a little bit on what the, what the integrals of motion are, whether they're extensive or not. Uh, but it seems that this glassy dynamics is completely universal feature of all nearly integrable systems. Whether it's universal glassy dynamics, it's always the same, or it depends on the system and so on, this is totally unclear. But this maximal chaos, which I mean, there's something I didn't mention. This maximal chaos is also uh, consistent with spectral some rule, so integral of spectral function converges. It's, it's your spectral, total spectral weight and so on. So it means that spectral function cannot decay faster than one over omega if it's asymptotic regime. But one over omega gives to one over mu squared. So basically maximal chaos corresponds to glasses in this sense. And now the question whether it's really asymptotically realized in all systems on, on uh, uh, basically, yeah, asymptotically when, when time goes to infinity, Results are kind of suggestive that it's happening, but you need much more work and maybe more analytic understanding to see where it comes from. And actually, one over omega is one over of noise. So this is something I forgot to mention. So this maximal chaos connects to this famous problem which exists with us for many years of one over of noise. I don't want to lie, I don't know about them. So, but if there is like, I don't think entropy, at least entanglement entropy will have a similar maximum, but maybe it's related because entropy is maximized when you are ergodic. But I was trying to guess to say that actually even with our intuition, these states are not very chaotic. I mean, they're very simple, um, but it could be that there is some relation, I don't know. Maybe if you send me some references, I can try to look at and see. Yes, we, yes. Yes. Zero what? Dimension. Oh, this is, the last part is just speculation because we saw, I mean, there is a belief, and I, I would say like, until this work, I was part of this belief that all models in thermodynamic limit will become ergodic. But uh, this is special uh, uh, when it's basically think about you have infinitely large system which is integrable, but only in the boundary you break integrability. And then if you think about how thermalization happens, so if you are like in the integrable part, you have your integrable excitations. I, I'm, I'm afraid to say something wrong, like the, the, I asked Damash not to kill me. The integral models, I know they have solitons, breezers, or some other. They have like some excitations which propagate, sort of like quasi particles. And they freely move, nothing happens to them. Then they reach boundary, it still doesn't break integrability, they reflect. But once they reach this link, you start getting three particle scattering. Right, so you scatter them a bit. Then and again they move, they come back, they scatter a little bit. So in this way, from the point of view of the quasi-particles, it looks a bit like zero-dimensional system. But again, I, this is just intuitive speculation. This is not like a mathematical, because we were trying to make sense. How is it possible? Actually, Hyun Jin checked this point like for more than a month, because we thought maybe we did this mistake, maybe we did this mistake. So we checked everything. and it seems that you never see ergodicity there. Yes, so 
for example, uh, uh, what I was trying to say, imagine your, this, your parameters are dynamical degrees of freedom. And then what I was saying that generally, the evolution will be biased towards integrable point. So in this sense, the point, they will self-tune themselves to integrable point. Just because it's just kind of this reverse and stream. So this geometry, in some sense, it also points directions of this dynamical motion. The, the geometry also renormalizes mass. It contributes dissipation and so on and so forth. So you have less dissipation in these directions. You have less mass renormalization in this direction. So it's kind of more likely you'll follow them. Of course, vegan isotropy only happens asymptotically when we're very close to integral points. When you are far, this anisotropy is very tiny. So, but uh, the, if you approach, if you have integrable line or point nearby, you're actually biased to move closer to it.